I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Can you please clarify the distinction between the African presence and the Nubian presence in ancient Egypt? Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> the reality is that Egypt is in Africa. Kush is in Africa. And the only difference between a Kushite and a Kemite is geography. That's the only difference. Phenotypically, they were the same color. They were the same people. And to say, to try to make a, a, a racial distinction between the Kemites and the Kushites is like trying to make a racial distinction between black folk who live in Harlem and black folk who live in Newark. They're the same people. They're just separated by a body of water. Um, and, and so part of reclaiming our historical and cultural legacy is to undo the brainwashing, the miseducation, and begin to rediscover for ourselves what our story was. So what we know for a fact is that when the Kushites came into Kemet as conquerors via the 25th dynasty, led first by, by Kashta and then his son, Pianke, uh, their intent was to restore Kemet from, from the invaders, from the outsiders, from the Libyans, from the Assyrians, from those people who had no idea that this was the world's first holy land. Um, and, and the Kushites came in specifically to restore the land of their ancestors the land of their ancestors. These were their words, not, not me interpreting what, what I think they said or think they meant, but this is what they said. And, and so um, <clears throat> when they did come into Kush, Pianke uh, was successful in, in conquering all of Kemet, Upper Kemet and Lower Kemet, uh, reestablishing the nation state. Then he went back home. And as a result of him going back home, uh, the enemies of Kemet came back in. And they, the, the most accessible point was through the north, uh, through the Mediterranean. They came back in. So as a consequence, after Pianke died, uh, his brother Shabaka decided to come back in and wage another holy war. And I say holy war because that's what it was to them. When Kashta, when Pianke and Shabaka brought their troops, tens of thousands of troops, the best archers in the world, the best horsemen in the world. When they came into, uh, into Upper Kemet, they stopped at, at Ipet Isut. They stopped at Karnak Temple and they bathed themselves. The soldiers bathed themselves in the waters of the sacred lake. Why? Because they were told that our men would bless them. The same our men whose Holy of Holies was enshrined in Ipet Isut, Karnak Temple, was the same our men whose shrine was at Jebel Barco in Kush. So uh, we know that some of the most important personalities, some of the most important natural uh, of Kemet came out of Kush. Um, we know that the, the Kusto incense burner and the, the, the origins of Medu Necher, the origins of the image of, um, of the, the falcon seated on a Sarek, uh, the origins of the crown that represents the king of Upper Kemet, all of that comes out of Kush. All of that comes out of Kush. And I discovered um, a few years ago, thanks to my good friend, uh, Hali Garima, who was also a teacher to uh, your colleague, Felicia, um, that the knowledge that we have been searching for uh, in Kush and Kemet originated in Ethiopia. And I discovered uh, that there is a festival that the Ethiopians celebrate every, every year, the Ariche Festival. Uh, your good friend, um, I'm blanking on his name right now, comes. He was, in the, uh, he was in your film, Happy. He's a photographer for the New York Times. Chester Higgins. Chester Higgins, yes. Chester Higgins goes to Ethiopia regularly uh, to, to photograph this history and culture. Well, this annual festival that is held in Ethiopia is a festival that commemorates uh, the, the murder, the ritualistic murder 
of the leader of this ancient civilization and his wife uh, finds his body and, and, and honors his life. So it's the Asarian drama. It's the Ethiopian origins of the Asarian drama. And what's important is that that story is about 10,000 years old. It preceded the story of Asar and Aset and Heru and Kemet. So as John Henry Clark said, the Nile is a cultural highway and the culture and the knowledge flowed from the south to the north. So uh, it flowed out of Ethiopia into Kush and then from Kush into Kemet. So the Kushites were, in my estimation, they were, Kush was the repository of the knowledge of Kemet. Hence, when Kush fell, Kushite kings came into Kemet, restored the land, and then under the aegis of um, Shabaka, Shabaka decided that he wasn't going to do what his big brother did. He wasn't, going, he wasn't going to go back home and rule from Kush. Shabaka decided he was going to stay in Kemet and reestablish uh, his stronghold in Kemet and then sent his, his priestly scholars all throughout the country to, to give him an inventory of all of the temples in Kemet, all of the temples where at least by that time, 3,000 years of sacred knowledge had been recorded, historical knowledge, scientific knowledge, philosophical knowledge, mathematical knowledge, architectural knowledge was stored within these libraries. And so one of those priests came back to Shabaka to give his report and said that he found this one document, this critically important document that was worm eaten. Uh, meaning that um, back in those days, they didn't have Xerox machines, they didn't have printing presses. <laughs> so young scribes had to sit at the feet of priests and they copied, they manually wrote out these ancient papyruses and made copies of them, hence the art of manuscripting, uh, manually writing. And so they would take ancient text and then write a new copy of the ancient text. So this one priest reported to Shabaka that this very important document was found worm eaten, which meant that there was an interruption in this intergenerational transference and main maintenance of ancient African spiritual knowledge. So Shabaka then told this priest to write this document, rewrite this document and make it better than it was before. Now, the only way you can take an ancient document that was worm eaten, riddled with holes, the only way that you can rewrite it and make it better than it was before is if you had an original copy, which they likely did. And so to ensure that this document, this revised document would not be worm eaten, what did Shabaka do? He had it written on a block of stone, basalt, which is one of the hardest stones uh, on the planet. And that stone is now in the British Museum. It's known as the Shabaka Stone. And the significance of the Shabaka Stone is that it records the oldest story of Genesis ever written by human beings. An African story about the beginning, about the Neturu creating, the, a Netur creating the Netur who created the world. So it's taking Genesis back uh, further than you can ever imagine. So this is deep spiritual thought, man. This is deep science. Uh, and this is what the Kushites reintroduced into Kemet during the 25th dynasty. Uh, and it is what uh, Jan Asman in his book, The Mind of Egypt, referred to as the first renaissance in history. The first restoration of ancient African traditions in world history occurred during the 25th dynasty. And what these Africans from Kush did was they reached back into their ancestral memory at least 2,000 years and brought forth some of the most significant texts of the old kingdom. Hence, as we have uh, excavated and restored the primary temple of um, the temple tomb of Karakamen on the west bank of, of Luxor, Egypt, we have in Karakamen's tomb texts from the Book of the Hours all 24 hours of the Book of the Hours in the first pillared hall. We have inscribed on the walls texts from 80, over 87 chapters of the Book of Coming Forth by Day in the first pillared hall and the second pillared hall. We have approximately uh, 25 replicated chapters from the Book of Coming Forth inscribed on the pillars and the pilasters uh, and the walls 
of this temple tomb of Karakamen, and we also have pyramid texts, pyramid texts in this 25th dynasty tomb, uh, pyramid texts that were first inscribed on the walls of the uh, tomb of Unas at Saqqara. We've got that text, which means that either the Kushites had visited these sites and, and the person responsible for designing Karakamen's tomb had access to that knowledge or they had access to that knowledge, which they brought into Kemet from Kush. Uh, I'm still not clear about that, but the mere fact that we have the physical evidence in Karakamen's tomb is, um, is something worth investigating. And, and, and as we restore the memory of the Kushite presence in Kemet, uh, we are giving life to these ancestors and creating up other opportunities for us to dig down deeper and find more of this information that our ancestors uh, preserved for us. Because I feel very strongly that they knew this time was coming. Uh, they knew that we would have access to this information and they waited until the time was right, until the people were in place to allow this information to be uh, excavated and then shared with the world.